these dynamics, 200 years, 300 years in the, in the, in the lifespan of a dynamic like race and slavery in this is, is really not as much, I think, as we think it is. And the idea that there are historical, discrete historical eras is really just a way for us to measure time. It is not the way it works. Time is actually not 24, a day is not 24 hours long. It is, we've imposed that. We've as segmented way, it. To, we've, yeah, yeah, we've imposed these, you know, these sort of like structures as a way of telling time. But that's not the way that time works. Uh, time just rolls on and history is the same way. And we are in an era that is, uh, you know, it, it comes in waves. There's an ebb and then there's like a sort of the, and I said this the other day, the tide goes in, the tide goes out. But the, and we are in an era where we are seeing white pushback, for lack of a better term. The power structure, one of the fundamental power structures in this country, um, tied in, yes, with capitalism and money, but um, is pushing back. The pendulum is, is swinging a little bit, and it doesn't moves forward but it does swing back and forth within the context of that and that's what's going on here um and we have three survivors yeah in their hundreds who were alive in 1921 when the tulsa race riot or you can call it the the the, the black wall street massacre where a um a district in tulsa oklahoma i think it was called green uh uh, Green Greenwood Green I'm not Place sure. Greenwood uh, District was a um, a wealthy upper middle class uh, a black district um, and they were just basically I mean planes tens were, of thousands displaced um, but hundreds Greenwood. killed yeah in uh, in the Tulsa okay. white and, supremacy massacre and this clip came from like a day uh, uh, before, before yesterday uh, when a judge. I think dismissed. it was Saturday. So this the, happened Friday, and then on Saturday, the judge dismissed the um, reparations suit uh, yeah. by these three. Who you know, there was never any type of reparation for uh, what took place on uh, in, in those days. Here it is. Also, race massacre not fall under your definition of CRT. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't address that part. I would never tell a kid that because of your race, because of your color of your skin, or your gender, or anything like that, you are less of a person or, an, or are inherently racist. That doesn't mean you don't judge the actions of individuals. Oh, you can absolutely, that, historically you should. This was right, this was wrong. They did this for this reason. But to say it was inherent in the, because of their skin is where I say that is critical race theory. You're saying that a race defines a person, I reject that. So I would say you be judgmental of the, of the issue, of the action, of the content, of, of, of the character of the individual, absolutely. But let's not tie it to the skin color and say that the skin color determined that. One more follow-up. How does the Tulsa race massacre not fall you. under your definition of CRT? Uh, I, I answered it. That, that's my answer. And again, I, I felt the like Tulsa the, race massacre was a race massacre. I, How does it not fall under CRT? I, I, I've answered your question. I do appreciate. It. Very respectful. The hundred years of silence was about race. How does that not fall? How does that not qualify for CRT? I, I appreciate your question. Let me get some other people's mind. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, this is, um, they don't have the ability to go into the second and third questions of this. Mm -hmm. They don't have the ability. I mean, the idea that, and I don't know what it is, like even he's straw manning here as to what's happening to some kid who learns about the Tulsa race uh, massacre as a race massacre. You can't say these individuals to say that these individuals who perpetrated this just did so because they're bad people and there was no relationship to the power structure that existed in this country. There was no relationship to the resurgence of white supremacy in the KKK. To say that there was no response by feder the federal government or you know neighboring towns because of who, the, because of the race of the victims and because of the race of the perpetrators, to deny all that is to simply say, we are going to revise the, the reality of history. It's lost cause. And we, it's total lost cause. Yeah. And we're going to ignore this. And, 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 and this is 
just as at that time in the te late teens, early 20s, we saw all these Confederate statues going up because of the resurgence of the racism that the re-empowerment, I should say, of the racism that led to the the uh the oklahoma uh, the tulsa oklahoma uh, race riots we're seeing that same sort of dynamic today that's a helpful lens to look at anti-crt legislation as essentially the educational uh uh upholding of the confederacy and also akin to putting up those kinds of statues of confederate generals like just see it in that lens and it's much easier to understand and just like people should look up the images of these over a hundred year old survivors of the Tulsa race massacre and I mean the, 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 let's just put this up really briefly because it, it just sticks out to me and the judge who just essentially uni, unilaterally decided that they did not have standing because uh we've the the, the reasoning was that oh uh, you know you don't get to have payments provided for you for historical events that happened to you just so long ago when I've listened to the testimony uh, two years ago in front of Congress about the Tulsa race massacre by one of the people who brought the suit, I believe, Viola Fletcher. And some of the things she said and some of the things she writes about seeing at age seven or eight a man's head explode like a watermelon, she described it, hundreds of black bodies in the streets. Like, I guess if it was about the individual actions, it's just a coincidence that the hundreds dead were black and that massacred. the mob was white. You can only be massacred as an individual. I mean, wow, what a what a massive coincidence. Honestly, it's like lightning being well, struck 300 times I, in the same spot that the all of the perpetrators, essentially, a majority of them were white and that the victims were black and that they targeted the black neighborhood. I there, mean, there, what I a mean, coincidence. And, and to be fair, there were uh, white people dead because right. some black people uh, fought back. But this was a black neighborhood. It was perpetrated by white people. Um, and it um, literally, they, they flew planes with bombs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 100-year-old victims, uh, a 38-year-old, uh, what's that guy's name? Ryan Walters, Ryan Walters. Um, you know, born in 1985. He's going to be able to opine on this. And what's what, the panic? I mean, you can opine on it if you... But what, do the work of reading about it and understanding it. But the idea that somehow this is divorced from the question of race and that by, you know, like raising the fact that these individuals were guided by race, you have to believe that there is no concepts that exist. Like if you don't believe that it is a legitimate uh, characterization that white supremacy led to a race riot like this, then you can't conceive of any concept. There can't be things like freedom or the idea that we fight for democracy or the idea that like we uh, celebrate liberty. Like that means that no ideology can exist uh, at all. No ideas that uh, motivate people's actions, nothing, nothing. And of course he doesn't believe that. I'm sure we can find this guy talking about Judeo-Christian values somewhere. <laughs> Right. Or liberty or freedom or, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, there is no if you cannot cite. White supremacy. As a um, as as something that motivated and motivates people at different times, then you can't cite anything. The uh, the judge also dismissed the suit with prejudice, meaning it can't be refiled in state court. This was this these people's last opportunity to kind of get some reparations for their families as they near the end of their lives. Right. And it wasn't obviously just about. And, and the like city of any, Tulsa was the defendant and that's right. who she sided with. So this is the structural racism. Yeah. The city of Tulsa is still actively trying to deny people this justice. With regards to schools, like the panic that the right has about um, political activists being uh, inserted into the system, we should be as panicked about that's an appropriate level of panic but just for us and these people like this guy 38 years old he was like a, a superintendent or something like that yeah but like straight out of college just installed and now basically as a like a white supremacist yeah he was polite about it i appreciate the second question but i'm not going to answer we got a lot of other things to uh talk about and you know you'll see the same thing i mean clarence thomas of the same ideology like when he gets his um his ideological ass handed to him by KBJ in this, the same level of petulance. Now, 
when you have the ability to tell someone to shut up like this guy did in that video, they're not quite as babyish about it. Yeah. My daughter in elementary school, her first, her first year at school here, she comes home bawling, crying, because someone tells her that as a little black girl, she can't be what she wants to be when she grows up. You don't just serve the 20% the of the people who are loud and come screaming to all of these meetings. You serve me, you serve my children, and I demand you stand up for them. We know that arming our teachers doesn't make our children safer. In fact, it increases the chances that a teacher's gun will fall into the wrong hands or that a gun will discharge unintentionally and injure a student or, as happened in Texas a few weeks ago, which requires 80 hours of training, a school superintendent left a handgun in a bathroom that a third grader picked up. If more guns in more places made us safer, we'd be the safest state on the planet, and we're not. We apply the blood of Jesus to them, and we command those books to come out. And those that refuse, we command them to be removed right now in the name of Jesus. And I call for the fire of God and the glory of God and the fear of the Lord to fall on Clay County, Florida in the name of Jesus and in the school system and on the school board and every teacher, administrator, and all those who work there. And I don't care if you roll your eyes because God is watching. I do not wish the fire of God to fall on you all. That's not the God I serve. I serve a love, a loving and compassionate God. I come here to speak, not just as a parent of two Sumner County students, but also as a former student myself. Um, I moved to Sumner County when I was four years old. Um, I attended Beach Elementary School. We had a school of a thousand kids. Less than 10% of us were minorities. And there was a loud vocal minority who made it very clear that we weren't welcome. That people who looked like me did not belong in Sumner County. And, and I remember going to the library when I was a kid attending Sumner County, and there were not books of people who looked like me. There were not experiences in those books that shaped, that, that looked like what I was going through. And I remember the library being a refuge. Even though I couldn't find what I was looking for, it was a refuge for me. I'm, after I finished school here, I, I went on and continued my education, and five years ago, I had an opportunity to move back here and, and take a job in, in federal law enforcement. And I, I I spoke to my family, my wife, when we were moving back, and I told her what a difficult decision it was for me to come back here. Had an amazing education, top-notch education, but I knew that same loud vocal minority that made it hard for me to live here as a child would continue in the same path that they were on while I was here. My daughter in elementary school, her first, her first year at school here, she comes home bawling, crying, because someone tells her that as a little black girl, she can't be what she wants to be when she grows up. Another student in her class said that. She doesn't have the choice to wait until she's in high school to experience racism. She's gonna experience it right away. I remember when my daughter came off the bus that day, I saw her crying, I saw her from the window, and I just hugged her on my front porch because I remember going through the same things that she's going through now. And I'm thankful for the librarians and the teachers at Sumner County who were there to console her while she was at school before she could get home to me. Teachers here do an amazing job. Librarians are doing an amazing job. You do care about the emotions of these students. You can't teach a student if you don't care about them, if you don't care about their emotions, and if you're not there to support them. So from as a, as, as a former student here and as a parent, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And books like this make children like me see, see, be, see, be seen. And I thank you. And I ask you, all of you who serve up here, you don't just serve the 20% the of the people who are loud and come screaming to all of these meetings. You serve me. You serve my children. And I demand you stand up for them. Like people across the country, as a parent with kids in school, I'm heartbroken by last Monday's horrific school shooting and the lives lost forever and changed by it. Current Tennessee law generally prohibits guns in schools with several exceptions. In public schools, former current law enforcement officers may carry firearms at a public school currently so long as they've completed basic police training, they have an enhanced carry permit, and the local LEA has adopted a policy allowing them to do so. Current law allows teachers and staff who meet these requirements to carry at school. Remember, they must have served as a law enforcement officer to carry guns at school. HB 1202 obviously expands the presence of guns in schools by allowing teachers to carry even those who have not had that full law enforcement training. Law enforcement officers receive on average 168 hours of training on weapons, self-defense, and the use of force. This bill would let a teacher carry in school, again, with just 40 hours of training 
of some sort. This bill also makes it very difficult for schools to know which children or which teachers are carrying guns on premises as we talked, even with this amendment. You know, fellow teachers won't know, parents won't know, you know, which teachers are, do it, are ha doing this. So we oppose this dangerous expansion of arming teachers. If more guns and more places made us safer, we'd be the safest state on the planet, and we're not. We oppose this dangerous legislation of expansion and arming teachers. If, you know, as I said, last week's strategy might make people quick to think more guns is the answer, but more guns and less training is a recipe for a disaster for students, for school staff, and for law enforcement tasked with responding to a crisis where they don't know who is the good guy with the gun versus the bad guy, as Rep. McKenzie said, especially in a crisis situation. Just look at the CAM video from last week. Schools should be safe, trusting places where our children can learn and grow free from fear. While we are certainly basic security measures like internally locking doors and access control that all schools should implement, measures that make our schools more like military bases with signs that guns are inside do not create the nurturing and trusting environment that is conducive to learning. Introducing guns into schools isn't only ineffective, but you're introducing more risk instead of making anyone safer. Listen to school safety experts, school administrators, and teachers, parents and students. Please keep guns out of our kids' schools. Please oppose this bill. I'm a lot of things. I'm a pastor. I'm a father. And most of all, I'm a strong black man. And I don't hide that. I'm proud to be black. But somebody called me because they were distraught about books that were being removed. When you start talking about removing African-American authors and African-American history, I got a problem with that. And so Mr. Daly was very kind. And me and him are going to have a meeting about this situation because I want to bring some resolve to it. I want to educate some people about it because right now we are an embarrassment in the state of Florida. And it's all politically motivated, right? But I met the young man outside. I said, how you doing, brother? He says... I hate everybody, especially librarians. This can't be America. Well, we hate people? No, this can't be America. And I moved to this county? Mr. Superintendent, God bless you, sir. And to all of the members, God bless you all. Stay strong. If you don't do anything else, look at the words. In God we trust. God bless you.